be happy over there. Amen. You get me excited when you start talking about heaven. Hallelujah. You get me excited when you start talking about all the people gathered around the throne and us gathering together in a great chorus and shouting unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, I've got an investment up there. Hallelujah. I've got a home, amen, under the heavens not built by man. Praise God. I'm going to a city, Brother Hunt, that's builder and maker is God. You know, when I think about that place, I see my little granny, amen, just gathered around the throne, worshiping God with everything she's got. You know, when I think about heaven, I look back at Sister Allison and I can just imagine Sister Lewis gathered around the throne room of heaven, hallelujah, giving God a little bit of praise. I know we've all got situations. I know we've all got circumstances. But let me tell you what, it's going to be worth the journey when we get there, hallelujah. like a fat kid in a cupcake factory. I'm just happy to be here. Amen. I'm just happy to be here. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Everybody know what day it is? It's Valentine's Day. Sermon spoiler, I am not preaching on love. I know I'm probably a bad preacher, but I'm not going to preach on love this morning. Amen. But I do encourage you, if you have a Valentine, if not, if you don't have a Valentine, then you would be celebrating what I'd call Singles Awareness Day. And uh, so celebrate it with gusto, whatever you're celebrating today. Get your, get your honey something nice and uh, make sure that guys make sure they're all well taken care of. And I promise you, you will be thankful that you did. Amen. Because you will get to sleep inside tonight. It is going to be cold this evening. I don't want anybody out in the doghouse, amen. So do get your sweetie something, amen. I will tell you that I did hear a story this week about a, an older gentleman that 86 years old, and he was sitting out on the bank fishing. And uh, he heard this frog sitting on a lily pad talk to him and said, hey, you. And he thought he was hearing things, so he kind of did a double take, and he looked back, and the frog said, hey, yeah, I'm talking to you. He said, if you pick me up and kiss me, I'll turn, she did. She said, if you pick me up and kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess. And uh, he kind of staggered back. We picked the frog up and put it in his pocket. And he walked on along and the frog said, hey, you dummy, I told you if you would kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess. He said, that's all right at my age. I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> Amen. Happy Valentine's Day to you. How many knows it's good to have a little fun? A merry heart doeth the body good like a medicine. Amen. If you had your Bibles this morning, would you turn with me to Psalms chapter 142 and verses 1 and 2? Sister Turner was talking about being kind of unequally yoked in a marriage. I told Brother Zombic, I said, I married a sinner. And he said, yeah, but she's a beautiful sinner. Amen. I do appreciate my wife. I love her. Thank God for her. Thank her for being able to put up with me. Now, that's not an 
Y'all that know me know that's not an easy job to put up with me. I can have my quirks and I can have my, my issues and I can have my nuances. Uh, I'll tell you one more funny story. I know I've got to preach, but I, I'm not long-winded, so I won't hold you much past 1.30 or 2. But uh, we first got married, and I have this thing when I make a sandwich. I put the meat and I put the cheese, and the mustard goes on top of the cheese. And uh, one day, she, bless her soul, she had made me a sandwich, and uh, the mustard was in the wrong place. And I, and I was not mean about it, but I just said, Honey, I said, the, you know, the mustard... I put the mustard on top. Well, neither say the last time I got a sandwich made. But, uh, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. That, that is true. That's a true story. That I'm, I'm telling you, I've got. I, I'm weird. I've got. I've got problems. Uh, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. I don't know if we'll ever get a hold of this service again. Amen. Psalm 142, verse one through two. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before Him. Somebody say, I poured myself out to Him. I poured out my complaint before Him. I showed before Him my trouble. Hallelujah. I poured out my complaint and I showed before Him my trouble. I preached to you this morning from the simple thought, the danger of a full bucket. The danger of of a full bucket. Can we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to worship you. We thank you, O Lord, for the power of the Holy Ghost that's already visited us here. Now, God, I ask you, Lord, would you let me step into holy anointing right now? Would you let me, O God, step in, Lord, to the realm of the supernatural? God, would you help me to minister to your people, help your people to receive it? In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. If you give the Lord a great big hand clap as you're seated. Help me preach and I won't be long today. I will say I give honor to Brother and Sister Hunt. I do thank God for this wonderful couple, uh, these wonderful, wonderful people of God. They have uh, meant the world to me and my wife, and we give honor to them. Psalm 142, verse 1 through 2, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. Let me lower that down just a little bit. It is a disorder that has broken up families. It has cost lives and untold amounts of damage both physically and emotionally. It is something that does not take place overnight, but rather it is the culmination of sometimes years of emotional strain and stress and despair and heartache. Amen? It is something that is a silent enemy that begins many times uh, as an innocent hobby or as a simple way to comfort oneself from some type of traumatic happening. However, as small as it begins, it morphs into an insurmountable oftentimes problem for many and causes the decline and sometimes ultimately the death of the people affected. This morning, I talk to you about something that is not cancer. I don't talk to you about heart disease. I don't talk to you about uh, really anything that we would consider serious in our minds. But I talk to you about the disorder of hoarding this morning. Amen? The disorder of hoarding. Uh, It is something that affects 5% of the world's population or 350 million people, roughly the entire population of the United States of America. Uh, You may have heard about it or even seen some of the popular television shows that are highlighting the problem. Hoarding, you see, is acquiring large numbers of useless items and neglecting or refusing to get rid of them. One definition even says it is cluttering a living space to the point that it can no longer be used for its intended purpose. Amen? But as I said before, hoarding is not something that uh, happens overnight. It is an ongoing process that begins with maybe a small stack of newspapers or magazines or some other insignificant item and quickly grows into something uncontrollable. And I rise to declare to the church today that I don't believe that this is a problem that is simply isolated to the carnal realm. Amen. But I believe today that we are plagued with this as a spiritual problem as well. I'm going somewhere. You see, 
I've been in church a long time and I know that even as a child of God, there are things that can happen in life that can cause trash to accumulate uh, within us that can go either unnoticed or undernoticed. We sometimes begin to accumulate things in our life that don't need to be there. Things that we have no business keeping, that we have no business holding on to. And then we become the definition of a spiritual hoarder in that we are using the tabernacle or this temporary dwelling place that we live in. We're using our, 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 uh, our mortal being for something other than its intended purpose. And its intended purpose is to worship God. Amen. I would submit to you this morning that you were created for nothing else but to worship God. You were created for nothing else but to glorify God. Hallelujah. In fact, I believe that's why Jesus said, if you don't worship me, I'll have the rocks to cry out. Hallelujah. You were made to be a being that worships God. And so we get to this place of spiritual hoarding where we start acquiring things that don't need to be in our life. I proclaim to you today that you were built for one exclusive purpose, like I said, and that was to glorify God. Even God said to worship Him. He said, worship me in spirit and in truth. You were made to worship Him. Amen. These things may not necessarily be a sin that we let build up in our life. Sometimes they're just a toxic buildup of things in our spirit that are not necessarily sins, but that uh, definitely are not good things to have in your life. Definitely not things that, that you want if you're trying to live a life for God because they impede your ability to live for Him. Amen. What are you talking about, Brother Smith? I don't have anything toxic in my life. In my life, rather. How about hurt? Amen. How about despair? How about anguish? How about anger? How about all the things that the devil, that the enemy tries to pile on you to cloud your mind and to make you think that you are less than a child of God? How about when you get upset with somebody on the other side of the church? Or how about when you get uh, 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 sideways with your brother or your sister on your job? These are things that, that are not necessarily... Now, some of them can turn into sin. But these are things that by themselves are not necessarily sin, but that we have got to control because we'll begin to let them accumulate in our life and they'll begin to turn into things that we don't want them to turn into. Amen? Uh, I spoke very briefly about anger. Let me tell you, anger is a biblical concept. The Bible says be angry and sin not. Amen? It is not a sin to be angry, but it is a sin when you begin to sin because of your anger. It is a sin when you begin to unleash your anger on people and when you begin to uh, 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 deflect, if you will, your anger towards other people. That is something that is not good. It is something you should not have in your life. Amen. But that's not the only thing. Amen. Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So you see, it's biblical to get upset sometimes. It's biblical to be in some places that we don't want to be sometimes. Look at Joseph. Look at Job. Look at, look at all these men and, and women in the Word of God that were placed in, in predicaments and situations that they didn't want to be in, but it was ordained of God. Amen? And so this morning, what happens is we as the good apostolics we are, we never deal with the anger and the frustration and the hurt and the pains of life in the way that we should deal with it. Instead, we put it in our bucket. And everything is A-OK. -okay. Amen? You see, as long as it's in the bucket, I've got everything together. And it's all contained, so there's no problem. See, somebody upset me yesterday. But I didn't let it really get to me. I just put it in the bucket and I put it in on top and it's all okay. Nobody has to know that I was upset because it's in the bucket. Nobody knows what's in it. It's all there. And so as long as I've got it contained, as long as it's in that nice little container in my life, it's okay. There's no issue as long as it's all in the bucket. There's no reason to cry out to the Lord uh, about it because it's all in my bucket and it's taken care of. We've made the trash of life. Hear me when I say this. We have made the trash of life too sanitary. Amen. And we've learned to live with it when instead we ought to be emptying the bucket. Amen. We have learned to live with things that we shouldn't have to live with and we ought to be emptying the bucket, not filling it up. Amen. 
As long as nobody can see the scars, there's no reason to address the past pain. As long as no one can see the emotional scars, there's no reason to address the past problems and the past emotional damage that's been done. It, I'll just keep it in my bucket and nobody will know and it'll all be okay. I'll just keep it packed away. It's not His will that you are bogged down by the cares of life. Amen. And friends, today I've come to give you a word from the Lord where you're sitting. It's not God's will that you live with junk in your bucket. Amen. It's not God's will that you live with the stresses and the strains and the problems of life and you just keep it all nicely fit together down inside your bucket. That is not the will of God. Amen. It's not His will that you're bogged down by the cares of life and the things that the enemy would throw your way and cause you to not be as good of a foot soldier as you could be. You see, he's the God that loves you and that cares for you. And his goal this morning uh, is for somebody to realize that there is hope in your situation. Amen. There is a way out of your dilemma. Uh, oh, you can preach with me. It's all right. There is a way out of the circumstances and the situations of life. The Bible says he maketh a way where there seemeth to be no way. Amen. Let me tell the church it doesn't matter what the circumstance looks like it doesn't concern God how wide and violent the river that you're up against looks like just ask Moses God was not all too concerned about the Red Sea God was not concerned with how big the, 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 the water was God was not concerned with how fast the current was pulling in the water God was not concerned with these things amen so God is not concerned about the size of the situation in your life God is not concerned about how dark the cave is that you're hiding out is. I'm going somewhere. I'm not upsetting your theology. Hold on. God does not, is not concerned with your cave. In fact, 1 Samuel 22, David has been pursued by Saul's army. He flees to, flees to the cave of Adullam. And while he's there, the Bible says that everyone that was in the cave with him was in distress, they were in debt, and they were discontented. Now, how's that for a bunch of roommates? Amen. They were in debt, they were distressed, and they were discontented. And here's David in the cave of Adullam. And he's standing before him. In fact, I'll pause right there and tell you the opening text that I read. Most biblical scholars will tell you that when David said, I cried unto the Lord and I poured out myself to him, most scholars will tell you that was written while David was in the cave of Adullam. And so here we're in the cave of Adullam and all of these people are gathered around him. But it said David became captain over them and there were with him about 400 men. You skip on down there and Here's David and these men tucked away in the cave afraid to come out and afraid to do anything that the prophet and the prophet Gad comes and he tells David and he says abide not in the hole get thee into the land of Judah in other words quit sitting here in this stupid cave and get out and give God some praise amen quit sitting here crying in your, in your, in your Cheerios quit sitting here being all upset and being downtrodden and broken hearted get thee out of the hole and get into the land of Judah hallelujah let me tell you though it's all right to clap hallelujah let me tell you God wants you out of the cave this morning and God wants you in the land of praise amen uh, I've come to proclaim to this church this morning that the cave is not a place to dwell and you can quit packing your bucket full of hurt and despair and turmoil and chaos and you can come on out and get into the land of Judah this morning hallelujah I've come to tell the apostolic church here in Collierville that there is a way of escape you hear me when you make your way out of the hole. I speak a prophetic message right now and a prophetic charge under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. When you come out of the hole, you're coming out with a praise in your mouth and a shout in your step and a dance in your feet and it'll happen if you give whatever's in your bucket to the Lord. But you've got to be willing to give him the bucket. But instead, the bucket, it's, it, it's nice. You see, my wife said something to me that just really aggravated me. I just put it in the bucket. It's okay. She's looking at me like, you better put it in the bucket, buddy. That's one of them turn that page, preacher. See, somebody, somebody's really done me wrong. Put it in the bucket. Sister Child, told me before church your family needs prayer things are not all that good health wise and things of that just put it in the bucket 
I've, I've really done all that I can do and it's really hard for me to stand for God. But I ain't going to let anybody know about it. I'm My bucket's okay because, see, it's all contained. It's all nice. It's in there. But you hear me this morning. It is time. He meant that the apostolic people realize it's time to get out of the cave and get into the place of praise. If you just empty your bucket at his feet, 1 Peter 5, 6 through 8 said, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, All. all. Now, I'm fixing to preach revelation to you right here. That word, all. I, sometimes, you know, preachers, they, they, they get things out of the Greek text and the Hebrew ch- text. I looked that word up. You know what that word is in Hebrew? It's all. That means everything. That means every bit of the pain, every bit of the hurt, every bit of the despair, all of it. All your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And I've come with a challenge to this congregation this morning to tell you that God wants to fight your battles for you. Hallelujah. God wants to fix the hurt and the pain and the frustration in your life, but he can't do it unless you're willing to pour it out to him. Hallelujah. You've got to be willing to give it all to the Lord. You can't hold it back. You can't say, I'm going to take care of it later, but you've got to give it to the Lord. Would somebody give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise? So what happens if I don't empty the buckets in my life? The fact is they're going to multiply. Hurt is going to turn into more hurt. Soon that hurt is going to turn into grudges. Soon those grudges are going to turn into hatred. And what do you do with it? Okay, Nobody needs to know. What happens if I don't empty the buckets in my life? Concern is going to turn into anxiety. Anxiety is going to turn into fear. And fear will separate you from the greatness that God has for you. It's all right. I'm just afraid. Just keep it down in my bucket. What happens if you don't empty the buckets in your life? There are far too many situations for me to list this morning, but whatever you're facing, be it defeat, be it agony, be it marital problems, relationship problems, home problems, not having any joy, not having any peace, pretty soon these things will multiply if you don't empty the buckets. Amen. You've got to get rid of what's in the bucket. Amen. You see, I've been facing a crisis in my life, but I'm still standing. I'm okay. So I'll just tuck this away in my bucket. It's getting rather full, but that's all right. Amen. I've had some job problems, but I'm still hanging on to it because it's all in the bucket. Everything is okay. You know, I've been going through life. My children are backsliding on God, but I can't act like anything is wrong around the church, folks. I got to just stick it down in the bucket and make sure that Everything is is okay and and, and make sure that I look composed when I go to church. Amen. My marriage is on the rocks, but I'll just go on acting like everything is fine and I'll just pack it down in the bucket. Surely nobody will ever get wise to what's in the bucket. Amen. I'm having trouble keeping my sights on God, but I can't let anybody know that anything is wrong. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to put it in the bucket. It's all okay as long as it's in the bucket. I haven't been where I need to be with God, but I'll just keep acting like that I'm the best Christian in the world and I'm going to ball it up and I'm going to put it in the bucket and everything's going to be okay because it's all stashed away. Amen. And so we constantly pile things on top of an ever increasing bucket until finally it begins to spill over and then we've got a problem. What are we going to do? The bucket is overflowing. We have to look like we've got everything together. What are we going to do? So we got to do something with that junk. We got to do something. So what do we do? We find a bag. Let's pack all this up. We can't let this get out. We got to, got, to, got to stash it away. All the care and all the hurt and all the anxiety. I'm just going to keep it wrapped up. I'm going to keep it tied up. Because God is, because God, amen, cannot know what I'm going through. I can't pour my heart out to him. I've got to keep it all in the bucket. I've got to keep it down and covered up. But the bucket starts overflowing. So you have to find a bag. You start finding a bag. We can't make a trip to the altar because people will look at us because, like we're weak. So we just have to keep carrying our burdens around. And pretty soon we've accumulated so much junk that we've not let God handle that we become trapped. Amen. We become trapped 
because we've piled our life full of junk. We've piled our lives full of trash. We've piled our life full of things that don't need to be there. And so what started as nothing but a harmless bucket has now become a problem of ungodly proportions. We are here uh, surrounded by all the junk and by all the mar in our life. And what happens, we just keep piling it on. We just keep adding to it. And we never make a trip to the altar. And we never say, God, I've got to have you. I've got I feel the Holy Ghost. We say, God, I can't make it to the altar because everybody will think I'm weak. So what have I done? I've become a spiritual hoarder. I've become somebody that just holds on to all the hurt and all the pain and all the chaos and all the despair in my life. And pretty soon, we've accumulated all of this junk in our life. But you know what? We're okay. Honey, I promise I'll fold all the towels back up. We have all this junk in our life. We keep it all scattered about. We keep it all scattered broad. We've got to constantly make sure that they're tied up nice and tight so nothing gets out. We've got to keep it all under wraps because... We're apostolic. We got to look good. We got to have our cufflinks just right and our sleeves. Got to be, nobody can ever know that anything is wrong. We, we're, 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 we're above all of the things of the world. So, so surely we don't need a trip to the altar. So pretty soon, you've packed all of this stuff. And this is what begins to happen. Detrimental conditions begin to take place. Statistics say that 45% of hoarders have blocked access to their refrigerator. They have accumulated so much excess trash and useless junk that is now impeding their ability to reach their main food store source. Without the use of the refrigerator, there is no way to have a complete diet because they cannot keep the essential products needed due to their inability to reach the food source. The same thing happens with the church. We surround ourselves full of all the junk and we've let it overspill and we've let it overfill and so finally we're just stuck right in the middle of it all we're just stuck on every side there's just junk everywhere and so what happens I try to get to the word of God I'm looking at Brother Zombie's Bible. I'm trying to get to the Word, I, but I just can't. There's, there's something that's keeping me from getting down to the Word of God. I just can't get, get anything out of the preaching anymore. Brother Hunt, I just, I just don't understand why I can't get anything out of the Word of God. I don't understand why I can't read like I used to, and I don't understand why I can't study like I used to, and it's because we've surrounded ourselves with so much junk that we can't get to the food source, which is the Word of God. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something today. You must have the Word of God in your life. Hallelujah. You've got to have the Word of God in your life. Uh, amen. It is an essential part of our well-being as children of God. And when the enemy tricks us into thinking we can keep everything packed away neatly and never make a trip to the altar, we block ourselves in and we can't reach the Word of God. And it becomes harder to make it to the house of God. And it becomes harder to pick up the Word and read it. So we begin to spiritually starve. But remember, we're okay because it's just a bucket. Forty-two percent of hoarders have blocked access to their sink. The sink is an important place. It is access to drinking water. It's where access to drinking water is found. It is where the life-sustaining flow of water is found. Same thing happens with us. The Bible said, He that believeth on me in the Scripture said, Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Psalm 46, 4, There is a river, the streams thereof, shall make glad of the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. When you let the buckets get full and they begin to overflow and surround you, your access to the water diminishes. What do I mean by that? The rivers that Jesus referred to as flowing out of your belly was the Holy Ghost. And so when you surround your life full of junk, full of trash, full of chaos, then you begin begin to impede the ability of the Holy Ghost to minister in your life. And you begin to impede the ability of the Holy Ghost, amen, to uh, 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 have an effect on you because you are clouding up your, your, your judgment. You're, you're, you're secluding yourself in with things that don't need to be there. 
The enemy has a goal, and that is to limit your exposure to the Holy Ghost. Amen. That is what I meant by when you use the dwelling place right here. This right here is just a tabernacle for the Holy Ghost to dwell. That's all this is. Amen. And so when you begin to use this for other purposes, and you harbor bitterness, you harbor hate, you harbor strife, you harbor... Uh, 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 and I'm not just talking about sinful things. I, I'm talking about things that you just you just don't think you ought to bother God with. You're, you're sick, or, or you, you, you just don't know if you'll ever get ahead. You don't ever know if you'll get where God wants you to be, but instead you just... Pack it down in your bucket and pretty soon you've cut your supply of the water off. But we must stay connected to the water supply. We must have the Spirit of God operating in our lives. Amen. Acts 1 and 8. You cannot have power if you don't have access to the Spirit of God. Acts 1 and 8. Now you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So you get power through the Holy Ghost which is the Spirit of God. And you cannot have power unless you've got the Spirit of God. And you cannot have the Spirit of God as long as you've got junk all in your life surrounding you. Lastly, I'm hurrying. I've been up here 22 minutes. Acts 1 and 8. Last 42% of hoarders have lost their access to bathtubs. The bathtub is a place of cleansing. It is a place where renewal and regeneration takes place. Without it, things begin to get unpleasant very quickly. You don't believe me? You go hang around somebody and had a bath in a couple of days. Things begin to get bad real quick. Things begin to start stinking. Things begin to, to just get nasty. Y'all picking up what I'm throwing down? Amen. Things get bad. So the bathtub, it's a place of cleansing. Without it, things begin to get unpleasant. The enemy desires for the same thing to happen to the church. We get the junk stacked all around us, and we can't reach the place anymore where we can go to be cleansed. And that is the place of prayer. We get surrounded by all the cares and the adversities and the strife of life. And we can't make it to the altar anymore because we've got stuff in our way. We try to claw our way, but there's just more and more junk. And so finally, we surround ourselves to the point where we cannot make it to the altar anymore. Now that's what he does to the church, folks. Let me tell you, anybody sitting in here without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, amen, I want you to know this morning this church loves you. They want nothing more for you to get baptized in Jesus' name, receive the Holy Ghost, and be a part of this church, amen. That is the goal of this church, amen, to be the friendliest church in the world, amen, with no clicks and no walls. It says it right there on the wall, amen. So you understand, folks want you to be here. We want you to feel the Spirit of God. But what the enemy begins to do in your life before uh, you come to God is uh, obviously you've got things that have accumulated in your life and things that you think you'll never be able to overcome. But when you finally get to the place where you decide, God, I'm going to cry out to you right where I'm standing. I may not be able to make it down to the altar, but I'm going to stand right here and I'm going to cry out to you and I'm going to ask you for forgiveness. God, and you're faithful and just to forgive me. You're going to come down. You're going to minister to me. You're going to forgive me. But then at that point, once all the junk uh, begins to uh, get, get kind of moved away from you, you then need to get baptized in the name of Jesus. And what the enemy is going to do is he's going to put so much junk in your life. Amen. He's going to try to cloud you with so many thoughts and so many uh, uh, different ways that, that, that he wants to pull you that you're going to begin, amen, to lose sight and you're not going to be able to make it to the place of cleansing. And that is the baptismal waters going down in the lovely name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. That is where a, you are cleansed. Amen. And so we suddenly become too overloaded to pray. And instead of being able to drop to our knees and say, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit in me, we're barely scraping by and our situations are beginning to stink. When those three things happen, we've lost the access to the Word, we've lost access to the Spirit, and we've lost access to the place of cleansing. Spiritual death, my friend, will ensue. You mark my word. Spiritual death is on the hills when you lose the Word, when you lose the Spirit, and when you lose the place of cleansing. That's why I've come with an urgency in this hour to tell you in the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that God is fighting for you today. Hallelujah. Church, would somebody hear me? He's already won the battle over sin. He's already won the battle over hurt and anguish and despair because of his great love for us. There is an answer today that the answer is Jesus and you'll find him waiting at the altar. Amen. You see, we cannot afford to wait another day. 
But I've come to proclaim to you that there's nothing in your bucket that God cannot take care of. For greater is he that is in me, Brother Haley, than he that is in the world. Deuteronomy 24, for the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Somebody say God's faithful. Amen. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. You see, as long as you've got breath in your body, as long as you can still call on His name, as long as you can get to the altar, there is a way of escape. The world will tell you the only way to peace is through prescription drugs, psychological help. But I'm here to decree that everybody is more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. There is no weapon formed against us. Brother Manning Shackelford, that shall prosper. John 16, 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. You have overcoming power over the enemy this morning. Amen. I wish I could convince somebody of the great power that you can possess through Jesus Christ today. Amen. Amen. If God told you he'd take care of it, he will take care of it. But if somebody has got to be willing to empty their bucket before the Lord, you've got to be willing to get rid of it. If God told you he'd take care of it, he will. You may be saying, well, I'm, I've got too much sin in my life. But John 1, 9 says... Amen. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, well, God will do that for somebody else, but he won't take care of my problem. 2 Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish. Not any. Now, there's another one in Greek words, any. That means none. Okay? That means uh, not, not one of them. That, not any. Any of them. That, that's not one. Amen? It's not his will that any should perish, but that all. There's that Greek word again, all, all. Shouldn't come to repentance. Everybody in this house, everybody within the sound of my voice is supposed to come to repentance. I'm doing my best to get y'all out by 12.30. I know the restaurants get crowded. I'm hurrying. 2 Peter 3 and 9, amen, all should come to repentance. But I'm saying today is that there is nobody in here, be it with sin or cares of life or hurt or despair or pain that has outrun the love of God. God will take care of the problem and we've got to be willing to pour our buckets out to God before they multiply and overtake us. I'm getting ready to close if music wants to come this morning. I'm simply just a vessel, amen. I've come nothing this morning except to preach the anointed word of God. It's not my God, it's not my job to make the spirit of God move in here. It's God's job. Amen. I've done what he commissioned me to do. I've had this message on my mind for the last two weeks. I was up this morning, I was up last night, and I just told my wife, I said, I'm just going to preach something that I've already got prepared because I just can't get this to come together. But I felt in my spirit that God would have me to speak this today. And I feel like there's somebody in this house that needs to know whatever you've got in your bucket. I don't care if it's pain, I don't care if it's heartache, I don't care if it's hurt, I don't care what it is. God come here on Sunday morning, February the 14th, 2016, to change somebody's life. Hallelujah. And I believe that God is getting ready to do a quick work in this place. God is getting ready to do a mighty work in this place. Amen. Hear me today. It doesn't matter what you pack down in your bucket. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's pain. Maybe it's hurt. Maybe it's a feeling of inadequacy. I get that sometimes. Believe it or not, I feel inadequate. Some people think I just wake up in the morning like this. I don't. Sometimes I feel inadequate. Last night when I was studying for this man, I felt real inadequate. And you know what? I felt the Holy Ghost speak to me and said, that's because it's not your word. I give you the inspiration. I use you to craft a bit, but it's not your word. You preach the word. It's my job then to move. So, all right, Lord. I'm doing what you asked me to do. I'm being obedient. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Let me tell you what. I had a good sermon. I'll preach it tonight. I had a good sermon backed up in, in, the, in the iPad up there. I was going to make y'all shout and, and sputter and spit and roam and snort and swing from the chandeliers and everything else this morning. But I felt in the Holy Ghost that God would have me to speak this for somebody for such a time as this. I don't know what kind of heartache you go. I don't know what kind of heartache you've gone through. I don't know what kind of pain you've faced. I don't know what it is. But I know that God can take care. Maybe it's inadequacy. Maybe it's a grudge. Maybe it's hatred. Maybe it's envy. Maybe it's strife. Maybe it's a problem at home. Oh, we don't have those. I know. Y'all don't have problems at home. That's just me. I know y'all.
y'all don't have any. Problems at home. Maybe it's problems at church. Maybe it's problems submitting fully to God. I don't know what's in your bucket today. But I serve a God. That said, come unto me all ye that are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He didn't ask you to qualify what kind of issue you were bringing into him. He just said, bring it. He didn't ask you to ask permission. To, uh, he didn't call you. He didn't ask you to, to, to make sure he could, he could, uh, he could do what you're, what you're expecting him to do before you brought it. He just said, bring it. He said, I'll do the work. And so this morning, as I preach, whoever cleans the church, please do not have an attack. I'm fixing to do something. I will take care of it, I promise. God wants you just simply to come. And He doesn't want you to give Him any pre-qualifiers as to, as to what you can give Him. But all He said is, Well, come ye all that are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. He didn't ask you to qualify what you were doing, what you were bringing to Him. I packed it good in there. He just said, David said, I poured myself. I poured myself upon Him. He said, I poured it out. When the going was tough, when things were bad, when all the things of life were coming against me, I just poured it out. I just poured out what I had before the Lord. I just gave everything that I had to Him. And you know what? He came through and He'll come through for you today to this morning as we stand all across this house. I've come this morning with a simple word and that is take whatever bucket you brought in here this morning. Whatever issue you've come in here facing and I want you to come before this altar. If you have to knock the paper off the altar, go ahead and do it. But I want you to come before His throne and just say, God, I'm giving it all to you. I'm dumping all that I've got on to you. Amen. Because you are the one that is my way maker. You are the one that can heal me. You are the God that can save me. You are the God that can take care of every problem that I face. And this morning, hallelujah, at 12.15 in the afternoon, amen, I am giving a clarion call to somebody in this house. Give God whatever you're facing and He will give the rest. Hallelujah. Yeah. My soul is hungry I got this aching with 